Hi everyone, my name is Elena Martinez and I'm one of the artistic directors of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. I wanna welcome you to tonight's percussion discussion. But before we start, I wanna let you know that the Bronx Music Heritage Center programming is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew Cuomo and the New York State Legislature, public funds from the New York State Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Lily Auchincloss Foundation, and the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund. Tonight's program, we are recognizing that today is the anniversary, September 23rd, of the anniversary of the Lades Revolt. The small town of Lades in the mountains of Puerto Rico was where the first major revolt against the Spanish rule um, happened in Puerto Rico in 1868. It was planned by our heroes, Ramon Ambetances and Segundo Ruiz Belvis. And um, it is very fitting that we have the program tonight because we are, our, tonight our special guest is someone whose music reflects themes of social justice for the Puerto Rican community and beyond. So with that, I'm gonna to introduce to you the other artistic director who's gonna take um, charge of this event, Mr. Bobby Sanabria. Hi everyone, my name is Bobby Sanabria and you're here at the place to be, the BMHC, the Bronx Music Heritage Center. As you all know, we can't do things live at the Bronx Music Heritage Center, but through the magic of technology, we can at least meet with friends, family, and of course, great stellar artists like our guest tonight. Eddie Palmieri is a 10 time Grammy winner. He's a National Endowment of the Arts Jazz Master, the highest award that a living jazz musician can attain. And he's part and parcel of my history as a youth and today as an adult. And it's just a great pleasure, this incredible artist who has influenced us so much in terms of redefining Afro-Cuban dance music in New York City, or what we call salsa, which is really just Cuban music with a freaking New Yorican attitude. Eddie Palmieri has been at the forefront, and of course, in Latin jazz. We're going to explore all of the things that he's done in his life, but let's start at the very beginning. Maestro, Eddie Palmeria, it's great to see you, Maestro. Well, we got to unmute you first. Maestro, we have to un you have to unmute yourself so we can hear you. So maybe you can ask your daughter to help you out and un so you can be unmuted. All you have to do is unmute yourself. Better? All right. Now we can hear you. All right. <laughs> Let me give you a proper introduction again once more, one more once. Uh, no, no, no. You, you already gave me my introduction. Okay. Let me talk to you about you. <laughs> I just mentioned before that how proud I am of you and what the work that you've done and you're doing. And as a top percussionist, top drummer, and the work you did on West Side Story as an arranger with all your the musicians, the best musicians that you know that I know many of them that you've used. But the main thing is, I want to wish you the very best in all your dreams and your endeavors uh, forever. You understand that? You're Thank very you. important. You're very important to us. You have a brilliant mind. And we need that uh, to be able to give us the degree of respect that I believe that we certainly have earned and that we deserve uh, forever. Thank you so much, Maestro. It's an, indeed an honor and privilege to have you here. I wanted to ask you the very beginning, tell us your exact birthday 
and where were you born? Because a lot of uh, everybody associates you with the Bronx, but I believe you were born in Manhattan. Where were you born? I was born in the barrio. No kidding. I was born in 60 East, 112th Street, between Madison and Park, which is known now as the Charlie Palmieri Way. Fantastic. And then my and my brother and I were nine years apart. Okay, my mother arrived on a, on a cargo ship called El Cuamo, you know. And, and that was in, uh, in 1925. My father followed the next year because my grandmother couldn't stand him and chased him all over Ponce with a broom, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now they get married and my brother was born, Charlie Palmieri, the greatest pianist. You know, you always, I think we, we talked about that once in the school in Chicago, you know? Mm -hmm. You told me what my brother said about me and that my brother was the past, present and future of piano, pianist. No one will ever equal what my brother was able to play. I always said, I always would always say that my brother was the pianist and I'm the piano player, okay? Yeah. And, and, you, and, you, and you told me what he told me, but we don't have to repeat what you told me that he told you. But I love him so much. He was the greatest. He was my influence. He was my everything, you know, and, and uh, He's the one that recommended me to the different orchestras after I played with, my, oh, I, I played Timbales for three years. You know that, right? Right, right. With my uncle is Chino Isualma Tropical. It was a real typical Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico uh, uh, junto. My cousin, uh, my, my, excuse me, my other uncle, Frankie, played conga. We had Milo, who played with El, el, el Cuarteto, el, el, el Tarnel in Puerto Rico. Marolinque Cantama, my uncle was the MC at Chino, the leader, you know, he didn't sing or nothing. We had a bongo, Nicolas bass and trumpet. It was, it was, it was a good conjunto. I stood there three years and then uh, I realized that I had to leave because my mother didn't want me to play timbales. And she got together with my grandfather and they paid for a pair of ladies the first one I got was from a, a drummer called El Pato, who used to be with Cabello. It was a dear, dear friend of Tito Puente. And he gave yeah. the one the wing, wing tips. He made the timbales himself. That was my first pair. Then I got the lead. He said, then my mother, that's called superiority of women, bought the heaviest metal case. Took me, the case, the lobaule, they used to use for lobaule. <laughs> And now my uh, my my uncle would come and hit the horn of the, okay, Eddie, let's go to the gig. But it, it, when I'm gonna pick up the case, my mother would tell me, Eduardo, tú no ves qué lindo se ve tu hermano, Eddie. Don't you see how beautiful your brother looks when he goes to work and he doesn't have to carry an instrument? <laughs> when will you learn? And when I go pick up the money, I'm learning more. <laughs> So I lasted three years with my uncle. I started in 1949 around there, playing the, La Villa. La Villa, the, the Spanish villas that were owned by Spaniards at that time. And then I, I came back on the piano and my, but I had already at 11 years old, my brother had recommended me to Miss Margaret Barnes. She did the Negro history books. She was my first pianist. That was Charlie's teacher and mine. And then I, when I left her to play timbales, when I came back, there was a gentleman, a drummer called A.B. Lima. Yes. His family was Peruvian. And he recommended me to Claudio Savadra. Claudio Savadra was the, the, in charge of the choir at, the, at the, the church that I got married that the young lords took over. <laughs> okay. I got married there in 1956, and when and Claudio gave me the most incredible technique of the independence of fingers. You see, all the fingers are, are completely uneven. How do you play third and sixes that sound like bells? That's, that's, that's the, the weight distribution and the touch and press. And that took, took me years to be able to, you know, trill. The, the, the fourth finger. The fourth finger is the most incredible problem of the pianist because it has a muscle tie from the third finger to the fifth. So the, to, to lift 
the fourth finger, uh, Robert Schumann went lame building a, a pulley for that fourth finger. So that's how incredible it is. And Claudio Salvadora is one of the greatest teachers of te te technology, of technical uh, 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 presentation of how to play the piano. That you, you, to be able to play the piano, you got to have the independence of these fingers. And I teach that at, at Rutgers University. And I was very fortunate to meet him. Then I met Mr. Bob Bianco. So. Now, when you're talking about Claudio Sava, well, just a little back up a little bit, I, just for the audience that some of you mentioned some things that they don't, that may many, um, uh, some of them may not be aware of. When Maestro Palmieri talks about the Liris, he's talking about the timbales that were made by the Liri drum company that were considered the Stradivarius of timbales. That's right. And you can Why? Because Tilo Puente was my idol. Hmm. And uh, when you mentioned Las Villas, these uh, these were uh, resorts that were owned by many of them by people from Spain. That, Spanish, Spaniards, yeah. Yes, that opened up these resorts in the Catskills that provided a lot of work for, for many, many Latin musicians in the 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s. So you mentioned Claudio Savala. Was he Puerto Rican, Cuban, Spanish? And he was Spaniard. Hmm. He was Spaniard, and then he studied classical music at the Brooklyn Conservatory of Music. But he couldn't he play classical, and that, but never anything professionally. He was the choir instructor of the church. And that's where he, my wife and I they used to sing with our father, because they used to go there um, to, to, to sing it. He, and then A.D. Lima, I believe you know, you, and you mentioned your yeah. name, that name. He was the one that recommended me to go to study with Claudio, and it was the best thing that ever happened to me as far as the independence of fingers. You know, and, and you have to have the control of the fourth to the fifth, you know, and, and, and break them. In. And, and, and it, it, it takes, it, it's, it took me many, many years to do that. Eventually, then I got into the, the, the when I did Asuka, for example, Claudio was in, in my recording studio that year, and it's taking the guajeo on the left hand and solo with the right. It's a subdivision of the mind. Just like when you're playing the drums and the right. bass, everything, it's a subdivision of the mind going, you know? Right, right. Well, we're talking about, well, you mentioned your brother, Charlie Palmieri, who's a ubiquitous, ubiquitous piano. I never saw anybody that could play four octaves. Um, <laughs> Never. I mean, the closest thing that I see that that I can compare to him is the great Dominican pianist Michel Camilo, who plays. Oh, Michel Camilo, the great pianist. But no. my brother Charlie became unique. Why? My opinion, because he wanted also always wanted to be a band a band leader, dance a dance orchestra leader. Okay. In 1951. He starts with Tito Puente, and he stays with Tito Puente for three years around there before he goes on his own with a small group. A.B. Lima then travels with him in that, okay? That's an idea. But remember, when Charlie goes, before he leaves Tito Puente, that orchestra of Tito Puente, that rhythm section, starting with the pianist, which was Gilbert Lopez, okay? And then you have Frankie Colón on conga. You had Manuel Kendo Amongo, and then you had a gentleman called Luis Miranda that played, you know, okay? No, that was, that was the Machido band. That was the Machido band. Frankie Colon played conga. When they went into, Humberto Lopez and, and Frankie went to the Korean War, okay? I believe it was the Korean War. Right. Uh, then Mongo came in. And when Mongo came in from Mexico, then you had Manio Kendo, Tito Puente, and Mongo, my brother Charlie playing piano, and Vicentico Valdez singing. I mean, right. un conjunto. Tito Rodriguez had Monchito Muñoz, Rey Romero, and Chonquito. Chonquito nobody knew about because in 1959-60, when Fidel Castro comes into Cuba, he goes back to Cuba a promise he made his mother, a great percussionist. We never saw him again. 
Right. And then my Chitos band, which which with Uba Nieto, you know, El Mangual, and Luis Miranda and Conga. I mean, it just those were the years that you know, we don't like to go back and but those are the years that meant everything to me, Bobby, you know. I was a young man and listening to the records that were coming out, and it was just amazing. Machito, Tito Puente, and Tito Rodriguez, the top to me. Well, the gentleman that Maestro Palmieri is mentioning uh, for the Tito Puente uh, Conjunto, which uh, Conjunto is a Cuban band with trumpets in the early 50s, Bongo Santa Maria and Congas, my old boss, and uh, Manny Oquendo, who later on would put performed for you in La Perfecta in the 1960s was on Bongo. Oh, yeah. Maestro Puente on the timbales and vibes. And then with the Tito Rodriguez Orchestra, he mentioned Mo Ramon Monchito Munoz. May he rest That's right. Puerto Rico on timbales. Monchito Munoz was my brother's best man in his wedding. No kidding. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> well, anyway, he was on timbales. Vincente Valdez uh, uh, Chonguito was, from Cuba was on congas. And Little Ray Romero. Oh, yeah. Native New Yorker from Brooklyn, New York, was on the bongo. And then with the Machito Afro-Cubans, Ubaldo Nieto on the timbales, uh, Jose Mangual Sr. on the bongo, and Luis Miranda on the congas. What, you're talking about incredible percussion sections at that time period. Now, you're studying with Margaret Bond. You're becoming uh, known as a young pianist on the scene in the 1950s. And uh, then uh, you did get to work with Tito Rodriguez. Before you worked with Tito Rodriguez, who were you working with just before you got to Tito? Well, I, I, I started with Johnny Segui. Okay. Johnny Segui had a, a great conjunto, okay? But then they fired me because I hit the piano too hard. And the other band, the other pianist from Juanito Sanabria, that Pe Peñi Rodriguez was the singer, was called Pancho Jopetecla. <laughs> <laughs> they fired me and they kept Pancho Jopetecla. Unbelievable. It, but it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Why? Because my brother recommends me to be Santico Valdez's orchestra. Mm -hmm. So now I get to be Santico Valdez's orchestra. My first night with it, my reading, my my I, I, I was bad. I, I you know I was playing Tibali, so. I went on top of the, my, my, my reading music. I gave, I gave Vicentico so many different chords that thank God he was here at perfect pitch and he knew where he was going. Now I take my first solo that night. And when I finish my solo, so help me by the Lords, okay? Vicentico comes to the piano, he says, Eddie, Eddie. El solo que cogiste en el piano, the solo you took in the piano, sounded like a like a jukebox. You put a coin, and, and, and no direction known. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mario Kendo became then, which I thanked him many years later, made it his business to come to my home, my mother's home on Home Street, that wasn't married yet, and brought me twenty five. 78s of all different orchestras you know those records went from side a to side b i mean wore them out like my pianist jesus lopez de la caño and lili martinez my 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 mentor you know that started with arsenio and went to chapultin and down the line conjunto modelo and all that i mean i went into another one and that night after Vicentico told me that there used to be a restaurant called La Giralda, La Giralda on Prospect Avenue. In so we Prospect. went there yeah. in La Giralda. Mm -hmm. And this is, I'm talking about 50, 1956. And we go there with Michael Collazo. Mike Collazo was the timbal player for Vicentico and he would drive Manny and then he would start, he would cease to pick me up. And we would, the three of us used to go together and try to get Cuba on the radio. You know when we would get Cuba good? You know, on the on the Guatala Marqueta, you go underneath there, and Cuba was coming in great. You know, so now we get to the, to the we finish at the gig, and now we get to the Hirada, and Manny Kendo comes to me and says, uh, "Hey Eddie, let me know what you think of this." And you know the way he talked, 
let me know you take this. And he plays Me Voy Contigo de Chapultín. Oh, that changed my whole life, man. I learned it intuitively how they could excite me within two minutes and 45 seconds. And later on, when I studied with Bob Bianco, I learned from Joseph Schillinger, it's tension and resistance. And the tension and resistance comes from the rhythm section. So after a piano solo, I give it to one of the drummers. If I give it to the bongo, that's one. But if I give it to the conga in the, in the otimbal, the, the bongo player takes his cowbell. Unreal. And that's how you create the tension and resistance so that you grab the, the harmonic and percussive structures. And that leads you to the highest degree of a musical climax in every competition. And now after that, I, I, I it, it's like, now I knew what Duke Ellington said, if it don't swing, it don't mean a thing. Right, right. You're talking about people that uh, I, I, I had the fortunate, uh, I was very fortunate to get to know uh, as friends and colleagues like Mike Collazo, the great drummer and timbalero and uh, Manny Oquendo, et cetera. These were well, listen, Holy, Mike Collazo started with La Perfecta. Okay. He was the original timbalero right. with Chicken Perez. But in 1962, when he comes out of the service, I saw La Perfecta late 61, when I meet Barry Rogers in the Tritons that used to be owned by a friend of mine called Becco. He was doing jam sessions on Tuesday and I saw Barry, you know, and it was hard to get the trumpet players because I knew the best trumpet players because of Picentico and Tito Rodriguez when I worked for him for 58 to 60, but I couldn't afford they want the class A scale. So Barry Rogers, we, we did one trombone and one flute. And that was George Castro. And then he wrenched to me, put the other trombone when Jose Rodriguez came in. That was La Perfecta. And Manny Oquendo, what happened is how Manny got in the band is because Mike Collazo called me. He says, Eddie, I said, what's the matter, Mike? He said, Tito Rodriguez called me. And he started the big band again. That's the one he did, Tito number one with my, with Cachao, a great album. A great, me, uh, uh, Gene Hernandez did all the arrangements, kill, and, and so did Ray, Ray Santos. A great album, you know. Me, uh, Victor Paz, Mario Rivera, me, incredible album. And I said, Mikey, you can't refuse that, man, you know. You know. So Mikey goes, and goes, but listen, Eddie, Mikey, uh, uh, Manuel Kindle is not working. And that's why I take money to the Caskills, which he hated. <laughs> but at the same time, he became, and then we started to record together, and the rest is history. Go. All these people that you mentioned that just now, you basically grew up with them in the South Bronx. I mean, you were born in El Barrio. At what age did your family move to the South Bronx? I was, I was about five or six. My brother was 14. Charlie was nine years older. Right. So and at 15, at 15, I went to the Palladium. My brother took me because Tito was my idol, Tito Puente. And I met Manuel Kendall. Then I was playing stickball on Kelly Street. And I saw Manny coming up from the banana block, Kelly Street. At that time, it all changed now. And I stopped him. I said, Manuel Kendall, I'm in, oh, I remember you, Charlie's brother. Could you recommend a, 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 a piano solo? that I should hear, he told me, grab this mustard, uh, El Viejo Socarro. Mm -hmm. That was written by, by Lili Martinez, and he recorded it with El Conjunto Modelo. He did two numbers with them, you know, and that is the greatest piano solo that to this day, everybody was trying to still figure out the chordal changes that Lili did in 1950-something around there. <laughs> You're talking about that piece, Viejo Socarron. You, you got to record it later on on the Superimposition album, you know, so. Right, right, with Chocolate, with two yeah. trumpets. Right. But I, 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 I ask forgiveness for doing that from the original. <laughs> I pray to the gods. <laughs> These people like Mike Collazo, like uh, uh, Manny Oquendo, like uh, Luis Con Concochea, Orlando Marín. Right. All great musicians that you were boyhood friends with 
on Kelly Street, which is a particular street in the South Bronx that is shaped, part of it is shaped like a banana, hence the people right. the call it Banana Kelly. Yeah, and that's back, that's where when you go, you go, it's between Interville and, and Longwood. Right. You right. know, and and eventually at Longwood Avenue and, and, and right on Longwood and Kelly Street, we we opened up the first uh, lunch at my father, and it was called in Mambo. I was I, I was the soda jerk at 14, but I handled the jukebox, and it was the hippest jukebox you could hear. And, and when they played stickball, and, and the game was over, they would come into my father's can luncheon. It was a luncheon that my mother and my grandmother cooked, and they cooked great, you know. Talking about uh, well, just the, the synergy that was happening in that neighborhood, the amount of talent that came out of that neighborhood. I'm talking about other people like uh, Ray Barreto, Johnny Pacheco. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boyhood friends of yours. Tell us about the importance of stickball to that synergy that between all of you together. Well, stickball was our, our imitation of baseball, okay? You know, we got the glove and everything. At that time, we took three strikes and you're out. Like eventually, eventually, it went to one strike and no gloves. That's when I retired. I couldn't handle it because of my hands. But they would let me play once in a while. And I, as long as I put a golf club on one hand, and that, that, that was one. But when we were, the, the main thing about it, stickball for me was at that time, the commercial radio was playing Machito, Tito Puente, and Tito Rodriguez all day long. And you heard it loud. And that's and, and, and we're hearing that. Then the next thing we're going and looking for the records and buying them. We don't hear that anymore. The the youth have no idea of what those years were. They don't even know. I mean, you name it, my you name Machito, Tito, they don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah. Machito the orchestra started in 1939, and it was the greatest orchestra that ever was put together. A Pink Madera. You know, Mario Bausal. I mean, one, one after the other, Rene Hernandez. I mean, you know, you just go, and then and then after Julian Dino came Bobby Rodriguez, who then played with me later on. The reason that Bobby came to play with me eventually, and we did the Cal Jada album, is because Tito Puente refused to give him $5 more a gig. And he came by with me. He drove a taxi in South Ozone Park and then worked with me, and when and he helped me so much on the Cal Jada, two albums of Cal Jada, that's Bobby Rodriguez. Bobby nice. Rodriguez, and he also did in Moristoso, my second album, he solos on that. Right. We're talking about the great Bobby Rodriguez, the great uh, uh, Cuban-American bass player. I mean, you, I have fond memories of Bobby because we got to work with Marco Rizzo, the great Cuban pianist. I used to- Oh, that's another great pianist. We used to, I used to pick him up in Queens and we used to have incredible conversations. You know who studied with Marco Rizzo? Jose Cubello. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He wow. studied, when, when Jose Cubello left Venezuela in 1939 with $100 and he arrived in the United States with $100, he became a multimillionaire. And he studied with Marco Rizzo. And Marco Rizzo, they did a number on him, Desi Arnaz and that because that's the time of I Love Lucy. He's the one that wrote the theme and they gave it to a, a something Hatch or we'll something have, like we'll yeah. that. But it was really Marco Rizzo because there was too many Latins at that time. Again, the prejudice situation. Yes, Marco Rizzo, for those of you who don't know, incredible pianist. He was a, a disciple and protege of Ernesto Lecuona. One of the great pianists. Great, greatest uh, virtuosos and uh, yeah, and Maestro Palmer is referring to the theme song to I Love Lucy, the TV show. Marco wrote the theme for it, but the Wilbur Hatch, they gave him the credit. Wilbur Hatch, exactly. Because he, on the screen, when you see it, it says the theme by Wilbur Hatch. That was a concession that Desi Arnaz had to make. And the theme song of I Love Lucy was written by Marco, Rus Marco Riso. Right. If you get to see some of the old uh, shows when the band is playing, Marco is the one playing piano. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he had a good humor. He enjoyed the show, you know. Yeah, yeah. But you see, what happens is, if I may just throw this in, sure. Tito Rodriguez taught me, 
nice guys don't make it. <laughs> and then he said, Tico, before Tito Rodriguez told me this, Recuérdate esto, Eddie. Es un peligro estar vivo. It's dangerous to be alive, but you can't live if you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. Now, oh, one, one more thing. No. One more thing. I got to tell you, you're the percussionist. You're a great percussion. I used to take Manuel Candle to weld his bell. Oh, to uh, weld the bell. You know, yeah. Crack. It cracked. So, oh, Eddie, could you take, sure, I think so. The body of Fender place. Right. Now, eventually, in front of me, the guy goes, but what's the big deal? You know, with the bell, the cowbell, and you always bring it in. Emmanuel Kendall is bent and told, Eso lo que le da swing a lo que está. That's what makes the orchestra swing. <laughs> right, right, right. One of the greatest recordings that Emmanuel Kendall did that nobody knows, that he didn't even want to know about, it's called Tu Bito con su guitarra. He shows the artistry of bongo, the artistry of playing the cowbell, and then takes a solo. Tu Bito y su guitarra. If you can hear that, do it, and you're going to see what I'm talking about. Now this person, Manny didn't, Manny didn't want to know about that. <laughs> this person, Tubito, he was so he was a guitarist. Uh, uh, what yeah, it was it was a composition that that Vicentico did. Tubito, remember, to, it, 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 Vicentico's conjunto started great with Ray Cohen and all that, but he became a balladier. But in one in those things, he did a number called Tubito y su guitarra, and Manny shows the essence of what a bongo cero could do and should do. And ride the bells, and then take a solo. Unbelievable! What kind of tune is it? Is it a mambo or a, or a solo? Up, up, up tempo, yes. Wow! So there you go, collect collectors, and, uh, and um, yours truly will also be looking out for that recording, man. No, no, the, no, it was and the best one. The reason is is because I told that to Nelson Gonzalez. Okay, so Nelson Gonzalez is traveling with Manuel Kendall's band, you know, really, and leaving it, and he told them, uh, many, uh what could you tell me about to meet the week to who told you that? So he goes, I got my people. Eddie Palmier, that guy doesn't forget anything. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, Manny was an idol of mine. I never saw anyone play at Bongo, consciente pa conjunto, y cuando cogía el timbal. Era, eh, eh, you know, because the impeccable timing that he had. When we did the original Howl of River Drive in a number called Seeds of Life, I brought in, uh, what's, it, what's it, the great oh, uh, Bernard drum, Purdy. Huh? Bernard, Bernard Purdy. Purdy. And Bernard Purdy's gonna do an overdub. And he said, listen, Eddie, do me a favor. Take everybody off, but leave that guy that's playing that bell, the little cha-cha bell on the cha-cha. Man, and that's how he did the overdub. Wow. Man, it was impeccable timing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the incredible albums that you've done out of many. We'll get to that in a, in a second, but let's get to your career now with Tito Rodriguez, who had been signed in the mid-50s to RCA. He's becoming a name at the Palladium Ballroom on West 53rd Street and Broadway, the home of the Mambo from 1948 till 1966 run by Maxwell Hyman, a retired Jewish tailor. And it was a, on West 52nd Street and Broadway, a block away from Birdland, the home of progressive jazz on West 53rd Street and Broadway. So the musicians are going back and forth during their breaks. The Latino musicians, when they take a yeah, break. Yeah, it was a dance studio. Yeah. Five and 10 cents dance studio across the street from the the uh, the Ed Sullivan Theater. And uh, Maxwell Hyman, the reason that his wife was an heir of the oldest elevators. Wow. So one, money the hand. The best thing that ever happened there was we couldn't come to mid Manhattan, the racism. That's why they brought in the, the cabaret car later on. We had to go get fingerprinted and all that, okay? The only one that fought against it was Frank Sinatra. He never came into New York. He stood in the rustic cabin in, Cal in, in Jersey. But when the cabaret card came in, even Dr. Billy Taylor knew that that was the, the you know. The best thing was that Machito 
was being booked by Federico Pagani, the greatest promoter of a dance that's upstate. As long as you stood uptown, in the, in, you know, it, it, we were we were cool, you know. Yeah. Bringing them downtown to Midtown, you know, there was a lot of problems. The racial, Italian, excuse me, Irish policemen. It, it was a whole a different situation. Okay. So now he convinces Mr. Michael Hyman to bring Machito in on a Sunday, you know, a matinee. And Maxwell Hammond says, he agrees. It holds 800 people and top was 1,000. Federico packed the place with Machito. And now Mr. Hyman says, he says, too many blacks, too many blacks, too many blacks. And that's the greatest statement from, from Federico. You like black or green? So when he said that, his wife said, he's right, he's right. <laughs> and that's how the Palladium opened from the 48th to 40, kept going. I came into the Palladium in 1963, and I closed it in 1966. Wow. Now, did you, so you played at the Palladium before then with Tito Rodriguez then, right? Before. I started with Tito Rodriguez in 1959. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, excuse me, in 1958. My brother recommended me to, to, to Tito in 1959 when he made a small group and we drove to Fort Worth, Houston, and San Antonio, you know. And then from there, we came back driving now. We came back and then in 59, we did the Live at the Palladium album that I did with him. And then we drove to Vegas. And Vegas, we did a month there. And Tito would put on this six gallon hat and two guns and sing, my name is Hopalon Tito, bang, bang. And they <laughs> threw us out in 30 days. <laughs> so for Tito to say, so Tito to say face, he drove to California over the mountains. And then we went to California, a place called the Virginias. And we stood there and there we, we performed. And, and then we came back, but everything was driving. The reason that it was driving, because there was a place, a gentleman, I forget his name right now, but he's the one that used to throw the thing that the Palladium Ballroom. And that money was the one for the airfares, you know? Chico Sesman, that's his name, okay. Chico Sesman. And then, but it, and then all the other clubs were small clubs. So they paid Parada, 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 you know? Yeah. So whatever they, they played, if one of them didn't pay you, you didn't have problems you had problems to get back home for the tickets and that. So I learned that from Tito Rodriguez. You drive because many problems, you just get in the car and you drive back home. And I did that in 1965 called La Perfecta. Wow. I'm curious, this whole thing that, that Tito Rodriguez had this, this like stage show in Las Vegas, was that his idea or some promoter said, hey, You'll, you'll get over more with the... No, he paid $10,000 to a gentleman called Bernie Wayne. Okay. For that show. Bernie Crane was his accountant. Bernie Wayne charged him $10,000 for that soft shoe. And then his wife sang uh, a, a poor butterfly dressed in a kimono. And then he had Marta. And, uh, and that didn't work. It, it didn't work at all. Wow. I, I'm just cracking up because I, I, I mean, what did you guys think in the band when he said, "Hey, we're gonna do this Las Vegas act. I'm gonna come out like a cowboy with six shooters and do it." Did you guys say to him, "What are you crazy? What are you doing?" Or did you laugh? Or did you just, you know? Nobody there. <laughs> I heard Nobody it. there. We're gonna tell him anything. And I'll, I'll give you the best story about Tito Rodriguez, Manuel Kendall, and I. We get to his house and little Nick. Long Island, and now at that time the ice crushing machine, you know, ice crushing. We just come in, you know, ice, you know. And Manny and, and, and Tito Rodriguez tells Manny and I, Caballero, there wasn't un trago. I'm gonna do a drink that you won't believe, okay? And sure enough, he grabs cream de mint, pernot, you know, uh, 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 orange, oranges, slice, you know, 
a, a, a gorgeous drink and then the ice on top, you know, is just gorgeous, man, you know, and it tastes good. So it gives me my first drink and I take the drink, you know, oh, oh, Tito, I like that. And now he asks Manny or Kendall, <laughs> what do you think? And Manny said, well, ya que me comí la piragua. <laughs> What do you call the pilagua in English? The ice, ice. A, a, a nice crush. A nice, uh, <laughs> nice crush. <laughs> he told, ya que me comí la pilagua, give me a straight rum and coke. Dame un bacardi straight. Yeah. And Tito Jodi, wow, look at this guy. <laughs> he wanted to impress him with his... Uh, Manuel Kendall always wanted, Tito Jodi always wanted Manuel Kendall in his band. Manny or Kendall didn't like his style. <laughs> His way, you know, that's why he always followed Vicentico Valdez. You mean he didn't like his style of persona or his music? You know, yeah, the way he, you know, way he oh, had himself, you know, it, it, it didn't, you know, you know, he right. was like a dandy, you know. Right, right. Talking about Vicentico Valdez, I have a funny story for you because I got to work with, you know, as you said, he eventually stopped doing guarachas, mambo, somontuna, and right. I'm a crooner, you know. A, a bolero, just a balladeer, you know. So, the toughest gig I ever did in my life was at the Teatro Puerto Rico. I did, I did that one in 1956 with him. Yeah. Well, I played with him, backing him up. When I got the call, I said, "Oh man, this is going to be great." I, I, I remember him with Puente and those re old recordings my father had, and wow, what an incredible up-tempo singer. We go to the rehearsal with him, which was at the theater, and. It's one bolero, one slow ballad after the other. Sure. So, so uh, you know, the, he count off the tempo. One, two, three, four. Atiendeme. You know, like, and I'm going, okay, fine, one bolero. Then the next one, slower than that. Then the <laughs> next, it was 12 boleros. One hey, after Wow, he could drive you up the wall. <laughs> oh, my God, it was hilarious, but... Uh, but you, I, I want to tell you something about Vicentico. This is something that I didn't know. Ray Santos told me. Okay. Vicentico, the trumpet players that would come into the night would say, tune up the Vicentico. He had perfect pitch. Right. Okay. And you could tell that by when he sang, La Voz Elastica de las America. Right, right. He used to pitch. He used to. I had no idea that that, you know. Yeah, the elastic voice. That's what that was his nickname. Yeah, the elastic yeah. voice. And race, and then and then uh, Rene Hernandez. When I got to Puerto Rico, that I took to him, and then I sang it to me. Still didn't see it. He has to see. It. You know, you look at it, the design of the hole, which I learned from Schillinger. You see the whole thing. He hadn't seen it yet, but he does read more like it at first. An album that Rene Lopez set up with Andy Kaufman of the of the band. And and okay, yeah. so and now he takes up this Gerard changer that it looked like it hadn't played in 40 years or 30, 20 years. And 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 it's you know like this the dust that came out of it, and he puts it down and he goes, Toca el disco, you know. And he sits down with a pencil and the paper, you know, and it's a body body, bing, boom, the whole thing. I mean, he never got off the chair. Mm. And when he finished copying it, this is what I told him. I said, I Rene. And I'll say the name, oh Rene, if I could only do that, man. You know, Rene, do you ever miss, you know, to look at fire? He goes, Well, sometimes when I don't feel too good, I'm about set. Semi torn off. <laughs> he had perfect pitch. Remember, when he comes in in 1947, he changes the whole, but, 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 but he changes the whole Machido Orchestra from one level to an El Zumo, you know, because he was a genius. And then when he started to, play, and then Machido used to hear and play in the jazz rooms, so. You're talking about a genius walking in and listening to the, the harmonic structure and that, you know, killer. And all the arrangements that he did for Machito, 
were, were insane. And, and Ray Santos, uh, Rene was his mentor. That's why the album that we did, Me Lose My John, was so important because those arrangements were 65 years old wow. with just three trumpets. So, and Ray Santos put the four trumpets, four trombones and five saxes. You know, only a genius could do that, man. Oh, you know, I, could, I, I, I cannot do that. He did it and I thank him so much. And we worked together for six years. But uh, you want to hear a good story between Ray Santos and I and Ray Santos. Hey, Ray, and I had him on supplements. I had him on a miso soup. I had him on uh, everything I could do for you know, so he could. And and, um, uh, and I told him, uh, Ray, I need you to 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 arrive at a hundred years of age, so you can tell me how it feels to be a hundred years of age. And this is what he asked me, Eddie. I don't want to know how it feels to be a hundred years of age. <laughs> <laughs> and six years later. He passed away. I just finished one of the arrangements. I told you I'm doing 12 arrangements in my sabbatical here. One is called Rene Ray. Mm -hmm. I finished it and I did, I'm working on five and now I'm doing, uh, I'm doing 12. And one of them will include a requiem. Mozart did his requiem for the classical. I'm doing mine in, 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 in the, you know, the Congo. Right. You know, Afro-Caribbean. Afro-Cuban first, and then Afro-Caribbean, and uh, and oh, my problem is that we can't un santo no puede hablar de la muerte, so I can't use en man. It has to be un babalao. I talked to Camilo Molina, so it looks like to sing that I'm going to see if I get Pedrito Martinez to sing it for me because because if I sing it. Uh, that be the end of my recording career. <laughs> Just to recap a little bit for the people that don't know some of the people Maestro Pame is talking about. Rene Hernandez, great Cuban pianist, arranger for the Machito Orchestra, revolutionized the band. That, That's uh, right. And, uh, and also worked with Maestro Palmeri on several projects, including the Son of Latin Music album, which we'll get to in a minute. And, and Lalo. And Lalo Rodriguez, yeah, and uh, your vocalist, your young, uh, talented vocalist. Yeah, that was 1965, and then he does the 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 the, the white album with Chio Feliciano, Dieca Me Quiera, with the big the whole thing. But listen to this: he goes back and he 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 dies in his sleep. When you die in your sleep, they say you're a saint, un santo, you know. And I, his 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 wife Helen, I said, why? Because I used to go two hours a day. He was he didn't want to do it. He said, No, yeah, you're toy fuera, you know. And he was working at the Hotel San Juan, you know, pianist for the shows, you know, two different bands. And then and I convinced Cove Jene me, he did it. You know why? And when we, and when we finished two hours, he told me, if you come two hours a day on these certain days, whatever, I'll do it. Okay. Then I used to take him downstairs and buy him an espresso, an espresso, and then we drink. And you know why it had to be at four o'clock? Because he never missed a mass in church at five. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's how he died, a saint. Wow. Mm -hmm. They say you die, you sleep, you're a saint. So this requiem that you're writing in on, is, is going to be in honor of him and also Ray, Ray Santos as well. Well, no, I wrote, wrote, I wrote Rene and Ray. It's an, it's an instrumental. Right. The okay. other one has lyrics. Que te dice, la muerte me viene buscando. Babalu ayer, escucha o ya. O ya el, el, la, 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 la brava de, del cementerio y o ya el, el cajotonero, which is Babalu ayer. Iku, which is the death, me viene buscando, babaluye. Now I took this from el conjunto, eh, 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 the one I did, the one from, uh, oh, well, the Barale, Barale Mi Song, Barale Mi Song, there was a trio, a trio Matamor. Right, okay. And now they're giving him an interview, and I had to, I had to tape, and they're asking him about la muerte, and he said, la muerte. 
La muerte te está siguiendo todo el día. The death is following you all day. You get up in the morning and death is with you day and night. And that, pero, pero yo, que aprendí un son y dice así, la muerte me viene buscando para llevarme para el cementerio, pero cuando me vio tan serio, me dijo que estaba jugando. <laughs> <laughs> death took me to the thing. But when he saw how serious I was, he told me he was just kidding around. <laughs> So that's going to be in the lyrics of that Requiem. Y después what? Pablo dice, y tú no juegas conmigo, yo soy el rumero del piano. And you can't have a, no, un santo no puede cantarlo because they can't think about death. So I'm going to use Pedrito Martínez, que es babalao. And um, un babalao me dijo, Camilo Molina can sing it. So only about in, death. In so in terms of death in the religion known as La Regla de Ocha, or Ifa or Santeria, somebody who is an initiate, a Santero, can't sing about death, only a high priest, a Baba right. can sing about death. Okay. That's right. Exactly right. Great. Now, I wanted to get to your formation of this group that you're so associated with, and it was a revolutionary group. You mentioned it slightly in passing, but uh, La Perfecta, which was a group for those who are uninitiated by Estropamedi's uh, history, you have conjuntos, which are trumpet-based groups playing Cuban-based music. You have combos that have maybe a, a sax and a trumpet, small groups. You have big bands, obviously trumpets, saxophones, and trombones. You have charanga, which is flute and violins. But you came up with a, an idea of having a group with... Uh, that has the vibe of a charanga group because it has a flute, a charanga has flute and violins. But instead of violins, you had two trombones. The great Barry Rogers who revolutionized trombone playing and what we call salsa today. That's right. Jose Rodriguez, oddly enough from Brazil, and you on piano, Manny Oquendo on timbales and bongo doubling up on both instruments, Tommy Lopez Sr. on congas, Dave Perez, on um, bass and, and, right Perez, and then we use also Bobby Rodriguez on bass right. and later on Bobby Rodriguez and then you had uh, Ismael Quintana on the vocals and sometimes he he would play Guido or Maracas tell us about the formation of this group especially I, uh, you mentioned the Tritons which was an after hours well like what happened is when I went to the Tritons I saw Barry Rogers the problem was that I told you before that the trumpet players that I knew that I was working with Vicentico in that day didn't they want the class A scale, you know, and I, I couldn't afford it, you know, just starting. So I borrowed a thousand dollars for my mother-in-law, you know, you know, my, my mother-in-law started my band and I gave it to Beckel for a month and I ran the, the Triton and I had a friend that had, his father had a, a bar, so we were selling the, the liquor too, whatever. It didn't turn out anything, but La Perfecta becomes a hit in the Bronx. And once that happens, then out Santiago, because of my brother, they give me a, 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 an audition. Tito Rodriguez came to sing if I needed, but he didn't have to do it. And we blew the place away with them. And now I do the album, La Perfecta. That Perfecta started with four trumpets, four trumpets, the two trombones, and then one trombone and one flute as the budget came going down. <laughs> but in one number called it Gavilang, come por you nada más que la caño y se de, y dice, dice, man, that el, 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 el ritmo que no son, son, son montuno es la perfecta. When he says that, the race, uh, uh, I was saying, why don't you call the orchestra la perfecta? And that's how it happened. Wow. And then we stood in the Bronx and then until we were able to, now when I, to get into the Palladium, I had to rent the, 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 the one that became the second cheetah, you know, in, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a catering hall. And it was uh, in between the Palladium and the, and the Birdland. And I ran it on Wednesday against the Palladium. And when you look at, I said, I'm not there, folks. I'm the barker in the streets. Machito and Charlie Palmieri, not there, folks. Not there, folks. And little by little, Machito, by that time, I mean, see me, Mr. Jaime had lost his liquor license because of the raid with Rolando La Sedia. So now, and then he, he comes to complain to Jose Cubello, 
who's I'm signed with him, like my agent, with my brother. He goes, that kid, that kid, Charlie Pomier, his brother, he's driving me crazy. He, 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 and Kabbalah said, then you will have to book him. And he gave me 90 dates. Wow. At 100, uh, 90 dates. At $179.50, and Kabbalah took 10%, 1745. You mean 170 just for the band entirely? The whole band. Four cents. It was $72. Uh, uh, in four days, you get $72 to take away the taxes. But when the, since I was so hot with the Afro American, you know, uh, 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 promoters and dancers, the blacks on Sunday, I would pack it in. Now they would come to Cubello and say, I have to have any Palmieri we have because impossible. He in the Palladium, he was great with the accent. Right. Impossible. I tell you what I do. You come tomorrow and I see what I can do. As soon as the kids went out, he picked up the phone and said, Hyman, I'm pulling any Palmieri out on the 19th or whatever. whatever. Now the kids come back the next day. He sounded like Bella Lugosi. Were you able to get it? You have no idea how long you are. <laughs> how much? It's 600. Now he gets $60 commission and I walked out with 540. Oh, now we were cooking. <laughs> that's some heavy, man, but that's some heavy, heavy dues. I mean, I mean, the cost of living was low back then, but still, I mean, you know, man, 170 something dollars for the. $179. And, and never forget, $179.50. And Cabello took seventeen forty no and ninety cents, and Cabello took a, a seventeen forty five commission, ten wow. percent. For those of you who don't know Jose Curbelo, Eddie Mench, Maestro Pamen mentioned it before. He was a fantastic pianist from Cuba who his came from a family of musicians, and he hired Tito Puente first when he was very young. Uh, as and he the, had Tito Rodriguez too. Yeah, yeah, and then he even appeared. On America's greatest bands, yeah, on yeah. TV with Paul Whiteman, with his great band, but he decided <laughs> to become a booking agent, and I guess, and I could see why because the way he was making. Now, let me tell you a story. I tell you a story about Cubello. He told me, uh, "I'm, I'm, I want to make the payroll for you. Got to go to California." Said, okay, and when I give him the payroll, he goes, "You mean he takes up his classes? You mean to tell me?" You play the conga player the same you play the trombone player? I mean, you're coming from Cuba, right? I said, yeah. <laughs> that is totally beyond my comprehension. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told me, this is this one. Mira, mi hermano, and maybe we're going to work with him. Pagandole medio salario a lo cogero, pay them half the price to the conga players. I have an account that's already reached me fifty thousand dollars. Wow! <laughs> Amazing. Now, Benny Bonilla told me well, this. Well, well, let me tell you the sadness about that: the lack of respect, right, for a great pianist because of the thing the Cuba. That remember, the the horn playing stop and that, but the rhythm in the piano player keeps playing throughout the whole ball game. And whatever you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna say, I mean, the conga player, you're gonna pay him the same. It, that was the whole problem that I had with him, you know. But I won, it, you know, you know. Benny Bonilla told me a story, uh, told me, and I've heard this uh, as well from other people that Jose Curbelo used to ha ha have two six shooters. Or, 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 no, or, he had a gun, a legal right. gun. He had a gun, and he had a legal gun, you know. He had a gun, in other words, so when he would go to get paid from the promoters or whatever, if something happened, all of a sudden he pulled back his jacket and the gun would appear. <laughs> he got paid. <laughs> yeah, so, he, that, so that was true then. He always, you know, had that now gun. No, the bass player with his father, and he would drive his father to his house and then leave him in the corner with his bass, and the father had to take a taxi to the rest to go to his house. Wow, wow. I mean, you know, you know, you, you know, you always remember what Tino Virginia told me. Nice guys don't make it. Jose <laughs> Cubello left Venezuela, I think I told you before, right. with a hundred dollars in his pocket. He he was a founder of the Riverside Orchestra. Right. right. He left at that time there was Panthers walking around Caracas and that. He left Caracas with a hundred dollars, got to New York, 
and he became a multimillionaire. That's right. In, in real estate, and all that when he moved to Florida. Right. right. He was no joke. Right. So you're, uh, you have this La Perfecta group with two trombones and the flute. George Castro's on the flute. Uh, and uh, you have this unique sound. And then you make an album that rhythmically changed the scene in New York City. And I'm going to hold it up for you. I'm sure it's going to put a smile to your face. This album, oh. <laughs> Mambo con Conga, is Mozambique. That's when the CIA and the FBI came to see Morris and Levy the first time. <laughs> okay. Because the Cubans that were coming from Cuba accused me of being a communist. And now Alpha 66 told the radio stations, if you play Eddie Palmieri's record, we're going to blow up the stations. That's how the CIA and the FBI got involved. Now they come to see Morris Levy, who is backed up by the Genovese family and the Colombo family, okay? Right. And now I go, to, and everything was Mr. Palmieri and Mr. Mr. and Mr. Levy. But that Mr. Palmieri is like giving you a kick in your behind and you're going down the stairs. When I signed my contract with Morris Levy, it said, oh, Lord, bring me a bastard with talent. Right. I had Symphony Sid on my left and Jack Cook on my right, okay? Now, the FBI comes, the CIA, you know, and Morris Levy calls me to the office. Just what, what, quick, I just want to explain who Morris Levy is. Morris Levy owned Roulette Records. Yeah. He has a unique distinction of having ripped off every single musician. Everybody. In any style of music. You're talking about Latin music. Tommy James and the Shondells. Yeah. R&B, doo-wop, yeah. even classical musicians. Yeah. John Lennon. And he, and he's the, and also he put up the seed money for the Sugar Hill Gang to. Let me read. give you a good. Let me give you a good example about Morris Levy. He found out that I was wanted to order his books. You know, to find out about my royalties. You know, and when I went to see him, and I get I'll get back to the, the thing of Mozambique. Uh, he says, "I heard you going to uh, order my books." You know, I said. And you gotta be careful how you answer, right? Otherwise, you'd be in in the concrete of the white stone of the new Frogs Lake Bridge, you know, just like that. Okay. I said, uh, well, Mr. Levy, you know, maybe I'd like to just know. He goes, I see. All right, Mr. Palmieri. Oh, I had to pay ten thousand dollars for the orders. Okay. Uh, Mr. Palmieri, when the order does come, what set of books should I show him? <laughs> <laughs> So he did me, he saved me 10 grand. <laughs> Watch this. Now, the FBI, so I tell Mr. Levy, Mr. Levy, it's like the conga. You remember the conga. Bum, 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 we're using backbeat. He goes, nah, I see, I see, I see. I see, okay. Uh, Mr. P and see, this is exactly what he told me. I see, okay. Mr. Palmer, don't record that shit for me anymore, okay? That took care of that, okay. The next album was called just Play Mozambique. Now, that's after Bamako Kong Mozambique, then just Mozambique. And now my problem is when I do Hollow River Drive, because I asked him, let me do Hollow River Drive on roulette. Yeah. And he gave me the permission. Now, and I figured this is my, Bobby, I said, this is my moment. I'm going to cross over. I'm going to knock him dead. <laughs> okay. And now I record Holland River Drive. And Holland River Drive doesn't do the sales that I was I was expecting. But my biggest fans, Bobby, were the weathermen. You know who the weathermen are? Yes, the revolutionary group. <laughs> they were bombing banks, they were bombing everything, you know? <laughs> no, 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 no. The, the weathermen. Now the, the CIA and, and FBI raid the weathermen. <laughs> and when they raid the weathermen, every, starting with the, you know, the, the leader had, you know, hung a river drive in their car. <laughs> so true enough, now they come back to Morris Levy. Unbelievable. You know, and I, I got to come back to Morris Levy. Mr. Palmieri, what did you record for me this time? I said, Mr. Levy. I told you, it's it's 
Hallelujah for joy. And it's, a, it's about conditioned past and present and future. I mean, it's all in the, uh, I see, I see, I see. This is Mr. Palmieri, Mr. Palmieri. I don't need the CIA and the FBI to come to see me for something that I didn't do. <laughs> is that clear, Mr. Palmieri? Clear the bell, boys. And the next album was most of bigger. <laughs> I never had, what's the problem? I never had, I, I, my problem was that I never was able to be told how to record and what to record. I was very fortunate in that way in my career. And it's, it, for me, it's something that I uphold very much that uh, I never gave in for anything like that. I, I recorded what I wanted to record, you know. Right, right. Yeah. It's a it's a fascinating uh relationship that you had with this gentleman, Morris Levy, but we uh we know your time is very valuable. And so and um, maybe we, we need to do a part two of this because there's Let's so much to go to to talk Whatever about your incredible career, your fight against the Grammys to get the recognition for Latin. Oh, that was something else. And I give uh, I give you the best one. When the gentleman was called Mike Green, that was in charge of the of Naris. Right. And I'm there. I was the governor at Naris for two years. And I'm there, you know, having my little lunch and that. And that's when I found out about the Latin Grammys, you know. Right. And I said, I put up my hand. I never you know, put up my hand. Phil Ramon was there. I put up my hand. I said, yes, yes sir. Whoever. Whoever came up with this idea of a Latin Grammy, I want to, I want to quote my dear friend, Mr. Colin Powell, you know, it, that was in charge of the military staff, you know, because he lived on Dawson Street, I lived on Kelly Street, with a year older than me, referring to the Iraqi army. Whoever came up with this Latin Grammy, we have to surround him and kill him. And when I said that, Phil Ramone says, Eddie, don't you ever hold back your words about it. The reason I said that is, look at the way it turned out. What we have there is really a, a, a fashion show, or, or uh, what do we call it? A, 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 some kind of, it has nothing to do with the best recordings. It's, they go by the one that sold the most, you know, I mean, everything is, it, it became a disaster, man. What you have there is like a, like a, I don't even know what to call it. You know, a gala ball, blah, 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 blah. that has nothing to do with our music. How hard it is for us to study music. How hard it is for us to be able to, to be able to present something musically to gain respect from your peers. You know how hard that is there. Yeah. You know, Bobby, that's no joke, man. Right. And, and and to do it like a, they do it like a, it's like a hit, that's the word. I'm, it's a hit parade. It's a hit parade. You're watching that, Jesus Christ, you know. So I was right. And when I made that prediction, unfortunately, you can't fight City Hall. It's very successful in that. But look what happened. They all were brought up now for corruption. Right. Very more, very important. And right. when I went to the one for that, that, uh, that the a young man, the young Peruvian gentleman won the Grammy, I, I told him I congratulate him. I mean, when they said they were going to give us lunch, they gave us a wrap, a wrap, and two little sandwiches. I mean, it's like, I mean, the lack of respect, you know, that exists towards us, you know, as musicians. Right. You know, and we're the ones that make this possible for them is beyond anybody's comprehension. We got to do volume two. Definitely. Real quick for the people that are listening, because we have to wrap it up with Mr. Palmetti because his time is valuable. Uh, we didn't get to talk about, uh, for the audience members, about Maestro Palmieri's studies of the Schillinger system and his studies oh. of Bianco. But we'll do that next time. Uh, if you want to find out, those of you who are watching, Go to Wikipedia and look up Joseph Schillinger, and you'll learn a little bit about. What that. comes out of that, what comes out of that is that the, his masterpiece was the mathematical base of the arts, which means that 
the spirit, you know, or 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 the or the the soul of music is mathematics. You can't move or all the arts. Yeah, I, I I did an interview once for Time Magazine, and I told him, listen, I'm going to tell you something. If Michelangelo, when he did uh, David, didn't know about the summation series of Fibonacci, for example, in the 13th century. That David would have looked like Bullwinkle or Daffy Duck. You you got to go by the summation series. Music makes you feel that even Aristotle said it has movement and it has actions. And if it has movements, it has to go under the, the laws of mechanics. And if they go under the law of mechanics, it has to have mathematical logic. So mathematics becomes the soul of music. And it's a hell of a, excuse my expression, to, it's, it's a hell of a debate to have, you know, uh, uh, mathematics, you, they'll fight you to the end, but it's true. There's nothing to do with art that, that the summation series, you know, you know, didn't make it possible. You got, we got to get back, volume two. Definitely. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, not only volume two, volume three and by volume four, you and I are going to record. Definitely, definitely. We have, we've been talking about doing that for the last few years of doing possibly... Uh, we've been talking about that for what, 15 I, years. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say what. It'll be a surprise. But the la just one final question from an audience participant who is... We didn't have enough time to get all the questions, but this question fascinates me. We'll close off with this question. Ryan Lynch, who played for you for many years trumpet, mentioned that Eddie and... Uh, you, Maestro Pame, and the great jazz drummer Art Blakey had talked about a possible CD, co a possible collaboration recording. Paul Ritchie, the great guitarist, is curious about that. Is that true? Were you in discussion? Yeah, we, we talked when, when they came to the Blue Note, not the Blue Note, the Village Gate. And he used to be Timmons that was with the Blue, with the messages. And, 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 and then Brian went with, with, with Art Blakey and we talked about it, but Blake would then get sick and pass away. But I always remember what, what Donald Harrison told me when he heard me play solo, when he came in to do the, the trio with Conrad Erwick, Brian Lynch, and him, Donald Harrison, the chief, told me, you solo like a like a drummer. And and, I, and I'm talking about Donald Harrison, who knows the press role of the, of Art Blakely when he when he was in the messages. We got to get together again. Definitely. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Our supreme thanks to Maestro Eddie Palmieri. There will be a part two. There'll be a part three. We just touched the tip of the iceberg. Thank part you. four will be a recording by you and I. You got it. You got it. I'm holding you got my you. word on that. You got me. You got it, Maestro. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being. Uh, Un abrazo, papi. Un abrazo. Igualmente, mucho Te deseo lo mejor siempre. Gracias, Maestro. Igualmente, mucho H. And Elena is, is, is uh, telling you, I love her very much. She's in the back uh, <laughs> telling me to wrap it up. I'm not, I'm not too sure about Mr. Diego, but you know, Elena, she's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and our thanks, our special thanks to Eddie, Edward Palmieri II for her. Oh, yes, thank you. And your lovely daughter as well for helping us. Gabriela. Gabriela. And ladies and gentlemen, as always, remember the virus is only temporary. The music is forever. Buenas noches from the Bronx Music Heritage Center and Maestro Eddie Palmieri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's it.